Hey, good morning. I'm Jim Fergo. I'm the facilitator of the uh, Virtual Job Club here at WorkNet DuPage. Uh, I'm honored today to have Kate Wollensack. Uh, she's the Senior Vice President, Chief Human Resource Officer for the YMCA. She will be talking about the application process, inside the application process. So uh, we're going to do some uh, administrative announcements, and then uh, I'll turn the controls over to Kate. Again, my name is Jim Fergal. I'm the manager of Job Seeker and Veteran Services. Uh, Javon Morris is on the call with us today. She's a workshop facilitator. Another workshop facilitator is Jennifer Wigeman. Tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're the, uh, funded by the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, the WIOA grant for those of you who are new. Uh, we do have a virtual job club uh, that's open to the public. Uh, we'll be moving into holiday mode uh, next month. We have two for October, one for November, one for December. Uh, we do, you do have to qualify for more of our services through the grant because it is we are funded by Congress. So uh, we do have job search workshops for registered clients. We do have training grants up to $10,000. And we offer uh, a layoff to launch workshop every Tuesday. So uh, let me go to that slide. If you go to worknetdupage.org, you have a get started uh, button there. And all you have to do is fill out the questionnaire, send it in, our staff will contact you, uh, send you an application, uh, and then that'll go to our uh, career counselor side of the house and start the process going. Uh, you do, as I mentioned, you do have uh, uh, job search services uh, as well as training. So this layoff to launch workshop is every Tuesday at 9.30. Again, you can go to our uh, website, worknetdupage.org. Uh, you can sign up for that workshop. If you are already working with a counselor, or if you've already been to our job search workshops, you don't have to take this again. Uh, this is for new people. Uh, you may qualify. They'll tell you how to qualify for up to $10,000 to upgrade your skills. Uh, while you're in training, you can continue to receive unemployment, and there's no need to pay it back. The only uh, way uh, Congress asks that you pay it back is that you let us know when you get a job. That's how the grant keeps going. Uh, we have certain metrics that we have to meet uh, for people getting full-time jobs. Uh, and I'll just tell you, I've, my tenure here in various positions with WorkNet, I've been here 25 years. We have always made uh, the 70% mark for us to retain the grant for the next year. And I will tell you in my 25 years, we've always made the 80% of people getting jobs. And what that does is that gives us more incentive money to serve more of the public. We are here today because of people in the past uh, who have found jobs. Uh, let us know the job title, the salary, and whether you're receiving benefits, because that's what Congress bases renewal of the grant upon, is does the program work and are people getting jobs? So again, go to worknetdupage.org, uh, look for the layoff to launch workshop, uh, Tuesdays at 9.30. Just a little, little Zoom etiquette. Uh, I do have the chat room open if you have any Q&A. Uh, you can go into the uh, question and answers. Uh, let's stay on topic. Uh, and Kate, if you don't mind, sometimes I may uh, interrupt if you don't have the Q&A open, uh, if something pertains to the topic at hand. Uh, please know uh, language uh, that is not job search related, uh, sexist, racist, offending, anything like that. Uh, we're all here to help each other. Uh, I know sometimes in the chat room people uh, give advice or they might type in links or things like that uh, to help people out. It's perfectly fine. 
uh, just let's focus on job search and helping each other out. Uh, the presentation uh, is being recorded and you will be able to find it on worknetdupage.org uh, webinars. As a matter of fact, if you are new or even if you're not new, you can go back and you can see uh, pretty much all of our uh, Friday job clubs, the webinars on our website. And there's so much great information, so many great presenters on there. Uh, if you have time, if you're sitting in the backyard catching some rays today, uh, flip in a, a little video, little webinar, and uh, just learn a little something. Okay. So at this time, I'm going to uh, surrender the con, give it over to uh, Kate, and I am going to stop my screen share, and Kate, you got the con. All righty. All right, thank you, Jim. Let me pull mine up. All right, how's that look, everyone? Can you see that, Jim? Yes, I can. Wonderful, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Jim, thanks for inviting me this morning. Um, my name is Kate Wallensack. I'm the Senior VP CHRO for YMCA of the USA. We are the National Resource Office that serves 2,700 YMCAs uh, throughout the country. Uh, we're located in Chicago, and again, it's a lean office. Um, our job is to support those Ys. So we don't have programs or camps or gyms, but we support all those YMCAs that do support the community. Um, I met Jim through my volunteer board seat on the DuPage County Workforce Board. So Jim, just to explain to you about the grant process and the 10,000 that's available. I serve on the board that reviews and looks at the funds coming from the state and allocates them um, and authorizes them through the community. So the Workforce Board was designed under the Workforce Investment Act in the Clinton administration, and we serve um, community through economic development, through our partnership with education and our partnership with the government. Um, it's a fabulous, fabulous, well-run organization. Um, and kudos to Jim and your team for hosting um, today. My hope is to provide at least one thing that you didn't know about the application process today, one thing that helps you in your job search. And I will open it up for questions if you have questions at any time throughout the cycle here. Let's talk a little bit about what my number one question is. And if you'll pause for a second. Even, even presenters have challenges for uh, disruptions there, so I apologize. The number one question that I hear from candidates, why does it take so long to hear from employers? And the number one question I actually hear from hiring managers who have these openings, why does it take so long to fill a position? And my number one answer is it doesn't have to be. But I'm gonna share with you how it, how it goes and a, and a little bit about the life cycle of what's going on with the employer and what we're doing with all that information. So even before a job ad comes out, even before you see anything on the screen, we have to evaluate a position. We have to build a job description. And even that can take days and weeks at a time. And once we get a job description <clears throat> with all the criteria in it, then we have to market price it to make sure that we have pay equity and that it's aligned with the market. Then the hiring manager has to fill out a requisition. They have to ask permission to fill this job. They have to review the budget. Do they have enough money to pay for this person, including all the fringe rate that comes with it? Then they have to go for all the approval levels before they can post it. And all of this is a huge waiting game, even before the job is posted. 
So you know that when you see a job posting, sometimes that took weeks or months to post. And I just wanna pause here to say, this is an opportunity in your network. Because even before something's posted, if you're networking and you're keeping track of employers or friends, or you're going to these job clubs, you may even learn about an opportunity that's in the works before it's even posted. So this is a traditional way of what employers go through um, before something's even posted. But here's what you see, right? So you've, you're on your job sites, you're on Indeed, you're on LinkedIn, you're on Career Builder, you're on Monster, you're on Ladders, you're looking for jobs, you're searching for positions based on the job title you're looking for or perhaps a specific company. And then you fill out the online application. You go into that wonderful online applicant tracking system and you fill out all the information over and over again. You attach a resume. Uh, in the middle here, you're spending time customizing that cover letter. You are attaching references. And then you hit send. And then you're waiting. And you're waiting and you're waiting. And you hear nothing. And then you repeat it all over again. This is why it takes so long to fill a job. Our hiring managers come back to us and say, why does it take so long? Well, it, it took a long time because we started a long time ago. How do I know this? Well, I see both sides of it. I see the employer side and I've been on the employee side. So as an employer and working in HR, yes, I have caused people to be unemployed. I have hired people and employed them. I have outsourced, downsized, and laid off people. Yes, I have. But on the employee side, I've gone through the same thing. I'm employed. I've been unemployed. I have been underemployed. I have been outsourced downsized, laid off, and transitioned. I understand both sides. I have over 35 years of HR experience. I've been in every discipline within HR. Um, I, I'm what they call a generalist right now, but I have spent time doing specialist work in um, talent acquisition and recruiting, a lot of time in the compensation and benefits field, learning and development, HR operations, and then a generalist is an HR leader. I've worked in Fortune 100 organizations, consumer packaged goods. I've been in the service industry, manufacturing, transportation, warehousing, logistics, union and non-union, and now I'm in a nonprofit environment. So I think I have a pretty good scope of recruiting, hiring, employing, and um, how employers um, react in this life cycle of looking for talent. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on the selection process. And we're gonna go through each one of these boxes because each one can create a lot of work and heartache for you, but I wanna let you know what's going on inside the employer. So remember we talked about um, what happens with my resume, right? Where is this going? Um, and why does it take so long? There are two ways that when um, applicants uh, fill in and send a resume in and they answer one of our jobs, right? Two ways the applicant tracking system can work. All of those resumes can go right to the hiring manager and they can screen them all, or all of them just go to HR and HR pre-screens them for the hiring manager, or both they can actually go to both as well. So you figure you've got hundreds of resumes coming in and we're all looking at these. And it's not just one job, there could be hundreds of jobs at the organization as well. 
So that's again why it takes so long. The first thing that I look at when someone has entered their application in the applicant tracking system, the ATS, I look for the pre-screen questions. Now you you may be frustrated by these when you go out and you're applying to a job and you come across a question that asks you specifics to the job ad. Um, I'm gonna use an example here that's just easy for me. So um, maybe one of those pre-screening questions that I had to answer before I could attach my resume was, do you have a certain certification? Now that pre-screen question can either be a block that you can only answer yes or no, or it can be a window where you can type something in. My suggestion to you is whatever you answer, answer the truth. Um, this is an application and it becomes a permanent part of your record with the organization. So if you don't answer it, correctly, it will come back. It'll come back either in your interview or it'll come back in your application. So answer it correctly. So if you have something, say yes. If you don't have it, say no. HR is an example. Maybe the question asks, do you have your HR certification? Like I would go back and look at the job ad and it said, well, it was preferred. It didn't say you had to have it. It said it was a preferred skill. So I'm gonna say, no, I don't have it, or yes, I do. But here's where you should take advantage if that pre-screen question has an open dialogue box where you can type something in. And it says, do you have your HR certification? Say, no, not at this time, but willing to get it. It makes a big difference in how you answer that. Just saying no says I don't have it. Saying no, but I'll get it if it's required for this, if you need it for this job is big. So just a little hint when you're answering those questions. Not every ATS allows you to fill it in. Cover letter. This is a big one. A lot of people ask me, do you really need one? Well, do you really want the job? Um, Cover letters show your writing skills. Cover letters show your tone. Cover letters can be a tiebreaker. Resumes show your chronological skills and requirements and what you've done in life and what you've achieved, but cover letters tell us who you are. A resume can't do that. So cover letters matter. And when I go in and I'm looking at all the applicants, I look at the pre-screen screen questions first, and then I go to the person's cover letter before I even go to the resume. So let's move on. The next one is I look at the requirements, the must-haves. If I need someone with a certain skill set or years of experience, um, then that's the next thing I'm going to be reviewing. I'm then gonna look at the question I asked about compensation. Now, as you may know or may not know, in most states, many states, it is now um, against the law to ask you what you're earning. And instead, the question is, what are your pay expectations? That we can ask. Um, I look at that because sometimes it tells me if I'm trying to hire for an analyst or specialist or an administrative role and someone's pay expectations are way outside the scope, um, it tells me that it's just not a match. So do answer the question on pay expectations. A lot of folks ask me, well, I know what I was making in my last organization. I don't want to say that. How do I learn what what the pay is for this job. There's lots of online tools that you can use for ranges. Um, you can go into um, a salary.com or payscale.com and find out what the range is for your geographic area or for your skill set. Again, if this is an open box, some suggestions that you can type in 
an amount, you can type in a range, or you can just type in the words market pay. Market pay says whatever the going rate is for this job, those are my expectations. We're still at the bottom of the screen. We're moving over to minimum qualifications. So then I look at what were the nice to haves versus have to haves in the job and does this person have some of those? I'll look at their experience. And then if all goes well, that resume is passed off to the hiring manager. And then we wait and we wait and we wait. This is where you get frustrated and we get frustrated that it takes so long. Um, that hiring manager is probably super busy. Why? Because they're missing staff and they're trying to hire for them. Um, they have a lot of other things going on in their life, but this is where HR will do some really strong nudging. You know, we'll wait a day or, or two, but we're gonna follow up and say, you know, if you don't take action on this, you're gonna lose these candidates. So it does take a long time, but we want you to know that we understand your waiting and we understand the longer that it takes to fill a position, um, the longer this hiring manager is gonna be working extra hours. So we do a lot of nudging and that takes a lot of time, but when we finally get a response after passing off the top you know, 20 resumes or 10 resumes to the hiring manager, then we're, we uh, collaborate on who are, who's that first outreach. So I'm at the top of the screen on the right. We make that first outreach to candidates. We're gonna call you and create some pre-screen selections. And then we set up interviews. This is, this takes the most amount of time. It is a logistical challenge um, to get, say, five decision makers on the phone with you, um, all in a reasonable amount of time. And especially during this remoteness now, it actually is harder, not easier. You know, when you can go into an office and you physically are interviewing folks, um, I can capture everyone perhaps in a panel interview. Um, it, it's been more difficult actually in a remote environment because everyone has so many virtual meetings. Um, but not to fear, we then have not just your interview, we have lots of interviews to conduct. And so that is a waiting game as well. And that takes a lot of time. My point here on this screen is you should continue to use your time wisely. While all of this is going on and you've hit send for one company, keep hitting the target, keep networking, keep answering ads, keep in touch, use your network as you apply for jobs. That's really important because the one thing that would bypass a lot of this right here in this process that you're seeing is if you have a contact within that company, um, that definitely brings you to the forefront. That will bring your skills ahead because networking and someone who comes with credible references is really, really important. You can't control every box on this screen, but you can control the ones in dark blue. You can control what you put in the ATS. You control your cover letter and your resume. And the rest is left up to the hiring manager and to the organization. Uh, Kate? Yes. There's a question. Uh, why don't employers just post the range for the position? Some do and some don't. Yeah, that's a great question. You're right. Some do and some don't. Um, if they have a very transparent process in their own organization, and it, their current employees know what the ranges are for their position and what they're in, they're likely to do that. But if they don't have a transparent process, they probably won't um, because that might create trouble in their own organization. They also may have, um, depending, a lot of times, depending on the response to their job ad, Maybe they're flexible on a director or a senior director or a manager with a really, you know, that needs to be developed. So they don't want to post the, the um, salary yet, 
because they're flexible. You know, I'll take someone who's spot on and got um, um, the right skills I'm looking for, but if I don't find that in my talent pool, I may take someone with lesser skills that has really strong um, opportunity to be developed. Uh, another question is, uh, should you automatically list your references or wait for them, wait for the company to request them? Good question. A lot of ATSs, a lot of the tracking systems require it, and it could be a um, field that you cannot bypass. In that case, obviously, you have to enter it in. Um, if, if the job ad asks for it, then by all means, follow directions and send it in. If it's optional, you may want to wait. Okay, uh, another question is, uh, do you see the job market opening up now during this time of COVID? Yeah, you know, Jim, you and I spoke a little bit about this before we got started today. There right. are jobs out there. There are jobs out there. What's happening is a lot of, um, a lot of individuals are making life decisions right now that they either want to stop working altogether and move out of the workforce. They're making life decisions on where they live and where they work. And as a result of that, we do see openings. We absolutely see openings happening. We see um, folks making early retirement decisions and going into consulting. We see, um, like I said, I've, I've had some folks who've moved across the country to be closer to family so that they can manage their family life or their children in a different way um, going in remote school, there are openings out there. Yes, yeah, so we've been putting a lot of jobs in our website as well. So I encourage you all to look at our website uh, to look for positions. Uh, this one slide has a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> why do certifications matter so much nowadays? Even if the person has lots of experience, they still ask for specific certifications. Yeah, certifications um, are current. When you get a certification, it means you are up to date on that industry and on and what's happening. Um, certifications, even though you, you may have been certified a while ago, there's usually a recertification process. So certifications are important because it says I'm current in my industry. Um, a lot of employers say it's a nice to have, not a have to have. Um, some are required because the job, if it might be from a safety perspective that you need it. It may be that they received a grant that's paying for that position and it requires certification. Um, there's lots of reasons for it. But again, if you don't have it, tell them you'll get it and they may even sponsor you and pay for it. Okay, uh, Kate's got a couple more here. Mm -hmm. uh, how much is too much work history to put on an application? How many years should you go back? <laughs> That's a, I wish I had the perfect answer to that one. Um, I give enough history to show that you qualify for the job. And then at the bottom, instead of listing all those other employers that say, you know, I used to be, let's say I was a coordinator and I was an analyst and I was a specialist and I was a manager, then I was a senior manager, then I was a director. Instead of listing all of that, knock off the stuff that says, I got to where I am, right? So today you're a director or you're at a higher level, knock out all the stuff that got you there, but put at the bottom of your resume, prior history. Just put the words prior history or prior work history, and you can list all those other job titles. I will tell you that's what I did. Like I don't have to list that I used to be a, an admin and a coordinator and a specialist and a senior specialist and an analyst. I just had this little box at the bottom of the resume or the application that says prior history. Okay, uh, geez, some great questions. Uh, can you please address the issue of advanced age people not to be offered a position with lesser pay because they a higher they have a higher pay history are employers worried if hiring at advanced age will lower pay or will they leave once higher pay somewhere else so i guess we're, we're talking a couple issues here mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I don't like the word older worker. I like Renaissance worker. Um, and uh, so you have people who've been in their industry for a long time. And what do you do if you're offered lesser pay? Mm -hmm. Or do you expect higher pay? And our employers worried that if someone with experience, I guess what their worries are about someone with experience is probably the short way yeah. to go about it. All right. So you're, you're talking to a seasoned comp person, and I love compensation questions. Um, pay is not based on age. Um, pay is based on your uh, market rate and the ability to do the job. And most pay has a range. It has a minimum, it has a midpoint, and it has a maximum. And those minimum, midpoints, and maximum ranges come from market studies, true market studies, not people just posting what they're being paid, but it's a, um, there's a st st statistical significance to those studies that are conducted. Now, here's what we say about those ranges. We pay folks in the minimum of the range who meet the minimum skill requirements. If you meet the minimum skills, you should be paid at the minimum of the range. If you're missing one of those skills, the employer has a right to pay you below the range until you meet the minimum requirements. Midpoint of the range. You're paid the midpoint if you are a seasoned practitioner who can perform the job, hands down. You've got all the skill requirements. Maximum of the range. You can teach the job. So that's where experience comes in in the range between the min and the max. It has nothing to do with age. Now, you assume that someone who is super seasoned is older, could be, but there's no discrimination in that. The other factor, so that's all the market information, that's what we call external information and what's being paid in the market. So we look at industries and we look at all, what are all industries paying for this job? What's the going rate? The second biggest factor is internal. If there are multiple people in the organization who hold that job, we have to make sure that those who've been with the organization a while aren't adversely affected by someone new coming into the organization who may have lesser internal knowledge. That's why you're paid within a range, um, but it should have nothing to do with age um, whatsoever, it's skill. I hope that helps a little bit. I'll follow up to salary. If you've given a range to the recruiter and then are asked your minimum acceptable salary on the ATS, is it reasonable to give the middle range? You know, like uh, 90 to 110, minimum would be 110. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. That's a, that's a great question because how the um, hiring manager, HR, and um, within the selection process, they should look at that as saying, okay, they're asking for the range, right. And then they'll look at your resume and say, oh, I see, why? Because they're seasoned. Okay, uh, let's go to education. If you don't have the education requirement, are you automatically rejected? Or at the bottom of the list, do some companies auto reject and put them at the bottom? And then if you don't have a degree, will certifications help? So it's all jumbled together, several questions there. Um, yeah, education isn't an automatic knockout if, if the applicant, if the, um, requirement is education or equivalent experience. So that's where you just have to prove you have equivalent experience if you don't have the education. Um, and that is absolutely where certifications can help because it's saying I'm a, I'm a um, qualified practitioner within the work that I'm doing, even though I might not have the bachelor's degree or the um, associate's degree to go with it. If you're currently going to school, make sure you include that. If you're in process of getting a degree, include that. If you spent any time in school but just didn't finish it, include that as well. Um, because the recruiter or the hiring manager may say, would you consider going back to school in order to finish your degree? So yes, I hope that answers your question. 
Well, I'm trying to keep up with everything here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a great topic, Kate. Uh, I understand. Yeah, when, when a company asks you, what brought you to our company? Are there right or wrong answers? I understand you need to do your homework on the company, but how do you make it sound without looking like a suck up? <laughs> <laughs> now there's a direct question. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's um, a standard question by a company, but they want to know really what they want to know is, did you in, look into their company? Do you know anything about the company that you are trying to apply for? So the, the right answer is that you've done a little bit of homework and say, well, I understand that you provide you know, meals and services to the community and that's one of my passions. Or you say, you know, I, I saw your opportunity and I did a little research on your company and I think I can really add value. That's, those are all right answers. It's not a suck up. What it's saying is, I did a little research. The wrong answer would be, well, I need a job. And I just, that's why I'm here. You have an opening, don't you? So, um, you know what, when you apply to a, a, a company, they wanna know that you actually um, are going to fit in and are gonna be passionate about what they do there. Okay. There's a, another, well, several questions. There are some job postings for uh, company internal H-1B associates. Thus, how do I know if it's a true posting or just the employer uses job posting as an ad for their H-1B workers? Not sure. Mm, I'm not I, sure what the question is there. Um, H-1Bs are um, sponsored and so if, they, if they've if they posted it as that, that means that they're welcoming and would sponsor you. Okay, back to age. Okay. Uh, for experienced workers over 60, does it make sense to be proactive in the interview to address the concern by talking about your energy, excitement, uh, to continue to work for another 10 to 12 years? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, it When you say that it's actually disclosing that you are older, um, if that wasn't already apparent through either your application process um, or some other means. But um, I think I would pause and, and make sure that before you say that, that you felt it was necessary. You can get a feel from an interviewer if they feel that you're short term, maybe through some of the questions they ask. Um, but it's hard to say that you will commit. Remember, it's employment at will. You can quit at any time. They can let you go at any time. And so I think to say a commitment is just saying you're worried about it. Um, in most cases, if you're qualified and you show the energy and enthusiasm throughout the process, you probably won't have to say that. If, if at some point in that selection process you feel it needs to be said, it, it doesn't hurt. Uh, here's another one going back to ATSs. Mm -hmm. uh, how many resumes, number percentage, will the ATS select and submit for review? Or does, I would say, does the ATS select them or does HR? Um, yeah, so every application hits the applicant tracking system. So whoever um, pushes the button and sends it in there, they're all in there. Um, but as what I still have on the screen here, um, the pre-screening and that selection process starts usually with HR and the hiring manager or either one. And you, what they'll go through is look at your minimum qualifications. Did you have a cover letter? So the, all these things in blue are things that could um, create what we kind of call the, um, you know, the A pile and the B pile. So, um, but the computer, the only thing that the applicant tracking system does is start to filter based on those preset qualifications. Okay, uh, some of these you may have addressed, uh, but let's go back to cover letter. Mm -hmm. If it's not requested, should you still submit one? Yes, it's okay. gonna be the difference 
as I, as I mentioned, I'm a strong advocate of cover letters because it sets the tone. It, it shows your writing skills um, and, and personalize it. It, you can you can have a template of a cover letter and have one or two lines in there that resonate with the ad. Um, I strongly suggest you put a cover letter in. It, it, it's been a tiebreaker, I will tell you, in some individuals, including thank you notes as well. Those are tiebreakers. Got to do those. Okay, uh, let's see. In your opinion, does not having a college degree hurt you? Do employers shy away from a high school graduate? I guess the bachelor's degree issue. So uh, again, if if it's um, if it's a requirement for the job and they have proven that that is a bona fide, bona fide qualification, then it may disqualify you. But if the job ad says or equivalent, then you're fine. There are also some jobs some very technical jobs where a college degree is not required. And you see there's a lot of um, discussion about this in the HR field and at the CEO level, when we were having trouble finding talent for their organizations, they are willing to drop the schooling requirement and look at people who do have um, minimum requirements and that we can groom them or they have um, equivalent experience. So. No, it, uh, degrees are, you shouldn't not apply for something because you don't have a degree. Okay, I'm gonna do two more and then we'll move on. Okay. Uh, do you recommend calling a hiring manager after you apply for a position and will that help you stand out? I was waiting for that question. <laughs> um, that is a tough one because the hiring manager is probably not the one with all of the applications. It's HR, and you don't know if HR passed off your resume to them, so they may not know who you are. Um, if you know them, however, so if it's just a cold call, um, it probably isn't gonna help. If you know someone who knows someone who knows someone, absolutely do the outreach. Absolutely, that's where your network is really strong. Um, I think it, you know, it depends on the person. It may or may not help you to contact the hiring manager. I think most hiring managers um, would be annoyed by that. They're going through HR. So um, if it's something you feel, I will say, and not to stop you, but if it's something you really feel that you're like, I am the perfect match for this person, and you look them up on LinkedIn and you find out that you have a connection or this hiring manager works somewhere where you did, then by all means, you have a special reason for reaching out to create that dialogue. But if it's just a cold call, it may, it may not help. Okay, uh, I'm trying to see if I can put some of these together. Uh, first is, is using Zip Recruiter one click a good idea? And then since Zip Recruiter has one click, what about this keyword software that the ATS uses? Uh, this person has used every keyword highlighted on the resume, but hasn't received any response. So the one click, sending a resume out, and then using keywords on your resume, why doesn't the ATS pick it up? Yeah, the one click is new for a lot of things, you know, like LinkedIn has that and I think Ladders um, just opened up another feature. Um, it is a great way for an employer to get a very large applicant pool to choose from. Um, for you, I prefer going on their website, applying through the website, um, my concern with some of the one clicks is I don't know what it looks like. And I will say this from a personal standpoint as well. When one click, so you're sending off a resume, you don't know how that's being formatted on the other side. You have to assume that those one clicks then are formatting into the ATS that they can see you and see your skills. 
And I say this because you know, when you go into the applicant tracking system and you actually, it says, do you want to upload your resume? Do you want us to autofill for you? And then it autofills and it screws everything up. And all of a sudden your history is just a mess and it's got the wrong dates with the wrong employers, right? So that's why right now I go into the company's website or I go in through the ATS and apply the one clicks. Um, I just have, I'm not convinced enough that it's going to come out on the end. Um, mind you, I don't have a lot of experience with the one clicks. So um, I'm hoping they've perfected them over the years and that the formatting comes across. If you're looking to apply to a lot of jobs, if you want to get your application in quickly, by all means, then do them. Separate to that was your question regarding keywords. Keywords are important, yes. Um, it, it goes into the ATS and it can filter out by keywords. But if you want to, I'd like to use that keyword for something else here on my next screen. So I'll pause from the questions for a second and finish this next screen where keywords become important. Okay, go ahead, Kate. Um, not so much in the, um, in the ATS, but here is one tool, and I'll just use LinkedIn as an example. Um, there's ways to make yourself accessible to the market. So everything we just talked about was the active market. You are actively applying for a job. You found a job out there, you're applying for it. Let's talk about the passive market, the passive way employers find you. We call it mining. That's the word for it. We mine for candidates. So for us to post a job, when we post a job on any one of those sites, it costs a lot of money. And budgets are thin, but it can cost thousands of dollars to post a job. Um, we usually buy them in bundles. So we buy them by thousands of dollars. And then, you know, Career Builder and LinkedIn and Monster say, okay, you got seven postings for that. So the other way that we can use a tool, and I'm just using LinkedIn as an example because I love, love their tools. It's called LinkedIn Recruiter. So remember, this is inside the employer side. I'm letting you see what happens on the employer side. LinkedIn has, um, they partner with enterprise companies, um, small, medium, um, they have specialized for nonprofit segment. And they actually have a relationship manager for me. And that relationship manager makes sure that LinkedIn and the tools within LinkedIn are working for me as an employer and as a hiring manager. So this relationship manager will help us post jobs. Um, they will help us, they can even give us uh, recruiters to pre-screen if we have like massive amounts that we're hiring, like in a warehousing environment where we need them to pre-screen for us. Um, most, in, they will help us build career pages out there. Um, so sometimes when you hit a link and you actually get a LinkedIn career page, they'll give us all the marketing support behind it. But here's the most beautiful part about LinkedIn Recruiter is all the data you have in there, where you've worked, where you live, years of experience, your network, all those keywords are mineable. We can go in and filter by a specific geographic area, by a job title, by a company name. Say if I want someone with experience and I love the talent pool that is currently sitting or did at any point in time, somebody who worked at a specific company, I can tap in and mine for that. And it's going to show me a list of who's out there. And that's when you start getting calls from LinkedIn. And you get a call from a recruiter that said, I saw your profile on LinkedIn. So by all means, make sure the button on your LinkedIn profile says, I'm open to getting calls from recruiters. Because if that button's turned off, we're going to bypass you. I just wanted to give you an insight on where to that person's question on keywords becomes really important. 
is when we start mining for your skills. Um, LinkedIn has a beautiful feature in that it'll tell me if um, I'm trying to hire a, a specific analyst, say a call center analyst or a call center, and it's saying, you know, your competitors are recruiting in this geographic area and they already have 10 postings out there. And so it'll say, would you rather post in this geographic area? And the reason I want to say that now is this is ever more important in a virtual world and in a remote work at home world. Employers, including my own, are willing to hire people that aren't sitting in Chicago because it says you can work remote. So now my talent pool just moved from Chicago and the suburbs from coast to coast. So don't hesitate if you see something that might you're a perfect match for that's in another geographic area. Um, there's an opportunity for you to stay where you are um, and still get a job for somewhere else. Uh, last piece here. Everything I just mentioned about LinkedIn, I'm sure Indeed and Monster and everybody else has it. The one thing about Indeed, um, Indeed is a sweeper. It's a sweeper site, if you didn't know that. It is, um, if a company posts on their own website and it's open to the public, Indeed will sweep every night and sweep those in. Indeed has a cool feature that allow, it'll send you the job ads and it'll tell you what the new ones are and it'll say there's three more posted for the job you were looking for, or the job title you're looking for. So go into Indeed and set up some of your own searches. Um, it's doing the hard work for you. So that's a sweeper. Company websites. Some company websites do not post things publicly. They only post them on their website. Why? Because it costs a lot of money to post things on Indeed and Monster and Ladders. So if there's a specific company that you want to target, go to their website. Make that part of your um, weekly routine. Check professional affiliation websites as well. Sometimes it's cheaper for an employer to post on um, Society of Human Resource Management, Engineer Association, World at Work, Benefit Association, um, because it's a cheaper posting. Indeed might sweep it up at the end of the night, but if not, make it a practice to find to go to those targeted sites as well. And then I can't say enough about networking and getting referrals. Um, that is absolutely a way that you will find about the hidden job market. You will find out about jobs that are in the pipeline that maybe haven't been posted yet. Um, and you definitely can get a push from somebody who already works there or knows someone who's already worked there. So with that, I do love your questions and I wanna make sure that we get to those. So Jim, is there anything else out there for us? I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute. So with the keywords, uh, what we're looking at is We've heard uh, with the applicant tracking systems, you have to have a certain amount of keywords because your resume is rated on keywords or education or whatever in the job description. So does the ATS uh, allow resumes to go through that have the keywords? And what if you don't have the right percentage or something? I don't think the ATS is going to be that detailed on the keywords. They may be detailed on experience, years of experience, some of those um, required qualifications. If a certification is required, it's going to focus on those more than keywords. Well, this is a question for me. So I've always said that it's not so much listing the keywords, but how you use the keywords. Uh, like if they say you want they want Excel, show how you've used Excel on your resume. Would that be more appropriate, or rather than yeah, just listing? If, yeah, um, if you again, depending on that's a great point, Jim. If, depending on the position, if there's um, some folks I've seen it on their resume, they'll put um, 
basic Excel skills, or they'll say master Excel skills. Um, so what level of Excel do you have? Um, you know, are you, are you just a, a seasoned practitioner in it or a really advanced? So you can use the word advanced Excel skills to really say that this is one of your, um, one of the areas that you, you have um, extreme experience in. So put the word advanced Excel skills. Okay, now, these are both, I have two questions here about contacting uh, the hiring manager. The first one is if you are 99% sure you know who your hiring manager, I'm sorry, the reporting manager, not the hiring manager would be, so who you're gonna report to. Mm. Finding them on LinkedIn and through the job description, would it be recommended to send them a direct message with your cover letter? Hmm. Yeah, like you said, I guess it wouldn't hurt. I, I, um, if you can find a connection to that person, all the better. That someone's making that introduction for you. Um, what they will generally do, or that they should do, that hiring manager or the reporting manager will then pass it off to HR. So if you say to the individual in your letter to them or your email saying, I saw your posting. Um, I want to let you know I did apply for the job um, online, but I'm really interested and you list some of your skills. Chances are they're going to take that and they will send it back to HR. Okay, uh, next hiring uh, manager. If you know the hiring manager, not from working together, but from volunteering somewhere, should you reach out in that case? Oh, yes, that's networking. Absolutely. Okay. Just, you see, you, oh, that's perfect because then you say, you know, I know you work at this company. I just saw an, an opening. Um, are you familiar with that or is that yours? Or, oh, that's perfect. That's absolute networking. And then uh, let's see another question Is it easier to find a job if you have a job? Does the net open emblem hurt or help? Um, I really don't think so. I would say in a time, um, in this certain time right now, where so many people are out of work to no fault of their own, it does, it does not make a difference. Um, there's lots of reasons why people may be out of work um, today, so that should not matter. The, the more important thing is, are you readily available for work and willing to work? That's more important. Okay, if you uh, during a gap of an employment, which I guess you could even say right now, mm -hmm. uh, if you've done volunteering or you've worked on a family business but didn't get a salary, is that viewed as rel relevant experience? It may not be relevant experience, but it is a great conversation starter. Or it's something that you may want to emphasize in your resume, right? Um, it's not uncommon for a hiring manager, a recruiter, or someone to ask you a question during the screening process that says, so I see you've been out for two months. What have you, um, what have you been doing with your time? That is a fabulous lead in that says, I've been volunteering. I've been doing this. I've been working on the family business. That is, um, that shows that you're resourceful. And I think that can do nothing but good. You may even, you know, mention that in the cover letter saying, you know, in, in this downturn in the market, I've been volunteering my time, um, especially if it might be an organization that the company's affiliated with as well. Okay, a general question, uh, actually someone who's trying to change careers, uh, and they put customer service as the title. Uh, but they're only getting sales or commission-based offers, which they don't want. Is there another title they should use? I guess that's if you have it like a monster career builder, indeed, a yeah. resume. Yeah. Um, so, is there another title you should use? Well, you can um, use both titles. So if your current title was let's use the example, I think if I'm following the example correctly, 
when you're applying to customer service jobs, you're only getting sales jobs. Um, applied, um, put the word customer service non-sales next to it. Um, customer service can either be um, outreach jobs where you're actually um, helping someone and navigating and problem solving, but a lot of customer service jobs are also upselling. And so what they're looking for may not be that you are selling, they also could be looking for the skill of selling. Um, so I think I would, if you, if you want to open up your search and get as many opportunities as possible, then be as broad as you can. If you don't want those invites and you say something like non-sales, then you have to know that it's closing your search a little bit. Okay, let's go to remote. Uh, how should you approach remote jobs as they may require being on site after the COVID subsides? Yes, um, you need to ask those questions. So right now, um, that is really strong in a lot of the job um, ads out there. It says we're currently working remote or they'll have a footer in there that says we're currently working remote. You have to ask the question is, is this per will you consider this job permanently remote or will it require me to work in your office? Um, you, need, you need to ask that question. Sometimes if you um, prove yourself and you've, you've managed the job remotely, they, they may keep it remote. Um, it all depends on the employer. Okay. Uh... Following up with that volunteer or knowing the hiring manager from volunteering. And I guess this we, we can talk about if you know the hiring manager and if you don't, should you reach out after you've had the interview? And if yes, how long should you wait? So first, if you know the hiring manager from volunteering, we'll address that. Should you reach out and follow up? Well, if that's the, if you've met with the hiring manager after the interview, or you, I'm assuming, let me see, I'm gonna assume that the question was, you had an interview with HR, but not the hiring manager, should you reach out? Um, I would mention, I would mention to HR when you're interviewing that, um, you know, I, if, is this job for Jim? Is it reporting to Jim? Because I, I volunteer with Jim over at the food pantry. Mention it to the first person that you, you screen with. Um, that's, that's networking. So what if uh, this person had an interview with Jim, uh, the hiring manager? Should this person uh, sign up, I mean follow up after the interview with Jim? Yes, you should send a thank you note if you've ever met with them. Um, if the, if the volunteer isn't someone who was in the pipeline of interviewing, but referred you or helped you in any way, send them a thank you note as well. Um, again, anyone in your network, if they're in your network, and a network doesn't necessarily mean your work network, it's your church, it's your school, it's your neighbors. Absolutely, the more people you know, the bigger your network, the wider the net. So yes, I would reach out afterwards. Okay, uh, next, uh, on LinkedIn, you have that uh, open to work logo uh, on your uh, profile. Mm -hmm. Some say it's good, some say it hurts you. What's your opinion? Yeah, I know, I see a lot of those out there now. Um, it, it, like I said, I think this is an unusual time. There's a lot of people out of work to no fault of their own can't hurt um, because what will happen is your network think about all the people that are in your LinkedIn connections and when they go out to LinkedIn if they don't know that you're unemployed they're not going to be able to help you so how that little flag that goes around your picture can help you is you've now notified the 500 people in your connection that you're looking for work so now you got more connections. Um, in this time, I certainly don't think it can hurt. Okay. 
Uh, what would you say are the top three soft skills that you look for in candidates? Um, soft skills. Uh, communication. You know, can they articulate what they've done? Can they talk through and, and have confidence in um, presenting themselves? Um, following directions, being on time. I can't tell you how many interviews we conduct and they say, oh, I had it in the wrong time zone on my calendar. Uh, oh, I couldn't get my technology to work. Be prepared. That's a soft skill that whether you're interviewing for a position or, or, or you're an employee, be on time, be prepared. Um, so I would, I would definitely say that. And then um, just have confidence. Um, flow with the culture, learn, get a little bit of background on what the culture of a company is, if you can um, pick up on that, and just um, come and approach those interviews with sincerity and a genuine interest in what the employer does. Um, I think those really need to shine through. And in this day when we're not going to a physical location and we aren't driving into a parking lot or walking into a reception area, um, it becomes even harder to get a feel for those things. Show up for those virtual interviews as if you were walking into the reception area. Um, I also want to emphasize in all of your interactions with a company, whether it be with um, the office of the building, when you walk in and talk to the uh, security force behind the desk, when you're talking to the administrator who's helping you navigate your way, when you're talking to IT in order to set up your interview, maybe there's something to set up for it. Every one of those interactions is being watched. Please, please, whatever you do, treat every person along the way with total respect. Because um, the last thing you want to find out is that the only person that you really had a good interaction with um, was HR and the hiring manager. Um, trust me that the person at the front desk or even sometimes in the office of the building, they'll stop me going, you know, that candidate that you brought in? So I would just say, eyes wide open. If I could just dovetail on that, an experience I had was years ago, one of my staff referred someone for a front desk position that I had. So they went to the county and uh, the receptionist says, well, you can have this, uh, we'll take your application, but the typing test is after the closing date. So this lady started screaming at the receptionist that Jim Fergal said that I should uh, get in the, the pool right now, per se. And a recruiter had to come out and calm this lady down and explain the process. Uh, as soon as the lady left, the candidate, that recruiter was the recruiter for the position and she called me immediately and says, what type of people are you referring here for customer service rep? Yeah, and I didn't even refer them, but they used my name, and that person would never get a, a because she, uh, if she's customer service and she chewed out the receptionist, mm -hmm. that's not who you're going to have. She blew all her chances anywhere in the county with that one. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's why everyone you talk to. <laughs> everyone. Everyone you talk to in IT, like if, like I said, if someone's helping you set up the Zoom call, thank them, you might get their name and send them a thank you note. It's going to set you apart. Um, everyone, everyone can be tapped in um, to make sure that you will fit into their culture. So if you want to work for that company, it starts with every interaction you have. Okay, here's one uh, about feedback after the interview. Uh, usually, if a recruiter has uh, sent you in for an interview, uh, feedback is usually pretty simple. Uh, they chose another candidate. Uh, so is it appropriate to ask for feedback at the end of the interview as a closing question? And are companies restricted from giving candidates feedback? No, I think um, 
obviously they're they're only restricted to answer in truth to maybe there was a skill set missing. Chances are it just meant the other candidate was more qualified. You know, and, and it's nothing you did wrong, it's just that the other person was just simply more qualified. Um, don't give up. Uh, here, here's another thing that happens more frequently than you think. Uh, we choose candidate A. We make the offer, they accept it. Um, if, if some employers notify you right away saying we've made another offer, we're good. Um, yeah, well, sometimes candidate A then goes back and gives notice at their employer and their employer counters. And candidate A doesn't come end up coming on board. So then they come back to candidate B and that's you. So don't give up. It happens more often than you think. Don't, um, if you do ask a question at the end of the interview, what could I have done better? It, you're asking for genuine feedback, that's okay. Always say something like, well, I really appreciated the opportunity to interview with you. And if anything should come up in the future, I'd be, you know, I'd please keep me in mind. Um, some employers are careful to not let the candidate pool go until they have a certain signed agreement. Um, and even in that case, nothing certain. Um, people keep looking for jobs. So even though they accept a job, maybe it wasn't the job they really wanted, they'll accept a job and then something else will come along and they'll go back to the, to the first job and unaccept it, decline it after all. So be careful on how you exit um, gracefully from any um, job offer you don't get. Okay, uh, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, if you are already scheduled for multiple interviews with a company, and then you see on LinkedIn that you have mutual connections with the hiring SVP. Should you mention that during your interview? Yeah, or, or reach out to the SVP saying, I'm going to be interviewing with your, your team on Tuesday. Um, you know, do you have any ad advice for me? Or, um, you know, is there anything you can tell me about the opening? And they may refer you to somebody else or they may walk down the hall or contact somebody so yeah networking is networking is key if you know someone who knows someone yes you should mention it again mention someone don't don't say you know somebody if you don't right um that happens as well and we hear about that a lot where someone a vp like in the to the example you're giving me a vp will go i don't know that person well if you know someone, then you know make it make it be a first line of contact. If it's an acquaintance, you just say, you know, that I know someone who knows someone. So just be truthful with it. Okay, and looks like the following here is um, this person earlier who knew a hiring manager through volunteering. Uh, did send a thank you note, but is getting impatient in the waiting mode. And who wants to wait, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then secondly, uh, uh, the son gave no, a two-week notice to the company that this person just had a third round of interviews. <laughs> Any thoughts? Wow. <laughs> so the company gave a two-week notice to the company she's just had three interviews with oh my gosh yeah okay oh, that happens yeah. um you know again uh we can't predict hiring um and what the vacancies are uh layoffs at one company and hiring does not necessarily mean there's something going on it depends that they've refocused you know, their uh, priorities. So I, I don't know that I can really comment on that one. Well, I, my sons uh, kind of are, were in this. My younger son was in sales and he got my older son into uh, operations in a freight forwarding company. And then as my older son came on board and was learning the system, probably a month or two in, my younger son uh, started, he was found on LinkedIn and started 
interviewing at another company and eventually took a job at another freight forwarder. So uh, the manager, my older son's manager came up to him and said, I know freight forwarding uh, family has a tendency to find family. And my older son said, well, what my, what my brother does is his business. I'm here. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I guess people do assumptions and you're assuming that because your son quit the company, you may get ruled out. You don't know that. Uh, they may hire you. They may take you anyway. So, uh, uh, and I, the final question that we're going to go with is, can you speak again on how to state on LinkedIn that you're open to remote work nationwide? And then we'll wrap it up. Say the question again, Jim. Uh, how do you state on LinkedIn that you're <laughs> open to remote work nationwide? Um, so there is a, uh, a, a button in within um, LinkedIn that says open to new opportunities. And I think that's in your settings. So make sure you go into your settings for that. As far as noting that you're open nationwide, I would just put that in your profile. You know, you know, open, uh, open to um, all geographic opportunities. I think there's in a, a preference area to note where um, if you want to restrict your geography, but uh, put it in your summary, put it in your headline if, the, if that's what you want to make sure people know. Yeah. Well, Kate, I appreciate you uh, presenting today. Uh, a lot of great information uh, that all of us have uh, had about the applications process, the applicant tracking systems, and how the hiring decisions come about. And I want to thank you for taking time out to join us today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kate. I'm going to wrap this up with some uh, administrative announcements. The recording will be posted next week on webinars. We do have to scrub it, edit it, and then post it. Uh, we do have a survey. Uh, please take a survey. It helps us uh, figure out what topics of interest you have, and then we try to improve our services along that line. And today, uh, job club is CL302. You just email that to your counselors. Uh, part of the grant is that you maintain contact with your counselors, monthly contact, and CL302, you just share that with them, email it to them, and they know you attended today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, please let us know when you find a position. Uh, it encourages others and it serves us to it allows us to serve more people. Again, this is what Congress bases uh, refunding the grant every year is how many people get jobs, what type of jobs, what salaries. Uh, and now the program is we follow up uh, six months or 30 days every 90 days. Uh, it's up to a year to see how we can help you. Uh, just this week, I had someone, uh, I worked on a resume, uh, just for you Renaissance workers here. Uh, she was 67 and in the travel industry and decided to uh, retool and become a contact tracer. Uh, and so we, uh, I worked with her about refocusing her resume on her customer service skills. Uh, and she talked in the interview, it was by phone, because that's why they're they going to do this job, um, about her customer service skills. And she got the position. And I told her, I said, she thanked me so much for her resume. I said, and, and this is important for you, uh, because I think this also comes uh, with what Kate was talking about with communication and confidence, is that she was energetic. She was looking at this as an opportunity and I told her, I said, I knew you are going to find a position. I could tell uh, by your energy level just by talking with you um, and, and that you were open to new opportunities. 
So that confidence needs to come through because a lot of times when you're transferring careers, you do have skills. Uh, it's not like someone performed a lobotomy and sucked them all out of your head. It's how you can use those skills in the new career. So I just wanted to let you know that. Uh, coming up next week, uh, Dee Reinhardt uh, will be uh, talking about social media uh, and your job search. And I just want to do something here. Chat room. Uh, wait one here. I don't know why I can't get in the chat anyway. Um, and at the end of the month, uh, I'm going to do my 20th annual Halloween job search story. Uh, the ghosts and goblins of the job search, the tricker and the treats. You can go to WorkNet to page. The social media is there. I put it in the chat room earlier. And contact information again. If you are new, go to worknet pageorg Go to the Get Started. Uh, you can sign up uh, for Tuesday's workshop uh, for a layoff to launch. And this is my email as well. So with that, uh, and I just posted in the chat room the link for next Friday's uh, job club. So I wish you all the best. And Kate, again, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Thank you. Taking us inside that process that we all wonder about. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Everybody. Okay. Okay, the link is there now. All righty. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kate.